Amen. So I'm going to be preaching a sermon this morning entitled, Seeing the Potential in Others. Seeing the Potential in Others. And what I want to specifically want to preach about is the fact that uh, we need to recognize what other people have to offer and treat them, you know, accordingly. And I want to help encourage us, you know, to be an encouragement to other people. You know, I think this is really important in the Christian life. And, and because of the fact that every child of God, you know, has the potential to do great things. You know, we should never think that uh, somebody, you know, that maybe is not, you know, on our level or whatever, uh, you know, somehow can't do great things for God. You know, everybody starts out at a certain level. Everybody has the potential to do great things for God. And that's a great truth that, that people often need to reassure their own selves of. You know, not just be reminded of the fact that, you know, um, we should treat others well because others have potential to do great things for God. But sometimes people need to be reminded that they themselves have potential to do great things for God. And because every child of God, you know, has potential, we should be very careful not to discourage other people in the faith. And, you know, this can happen, you know, uh, you know, even unintentionally. Often, you know, just through personality conflicts, through just people being different, coming from different backgrounds and having, you know, uh, just different views on things. People can often have a personality personality conflict and what that can actually can turn into is an excuse to try and discourage somebody else you know somebody might you know just develop a, a dislike or something and then actually that can turn into a very discouraging thing for that individual and we should avoid that and 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 really you know not just so that that person is better off not just so that person somebody doesn't get discouraged but because of the fact that that person is a child of God it's not just, you know, somebody we can uh, treat poorly out of whim. You have to understand that when you're in that church uh, and you're dealing with brethren, <clears throat> you're dealing with God's children. You're dealing with fellow children in Christ. So our personal preferences, uh, how we feel like we, we, we can or can't treat somebody, you know, gets, takes, takes a back seat to the fact that, you know, God's children are God's children. So we should be very careful how we treat God's children. And I want to uh, help us understand that rather than seeing people in a negative light, what we should learn to do in our lives is see the potential in other people. And not just see the potential, but then also try to foster that potential. Also try to you know, help that individual along to where they can uh, do great things for God. Now you're there in Romans chapter 14. If you look there in verse 4, it says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? You know, and that's sometimes that's what happens in a church, is that people start to judge another man's servant. And remember, you know, we're talking about God's servants this morning. Every child of God is God's servant. So who are we to go and judge another man's servant? Now, when people get into sin and things like that, I understand we have to deal with that, so on and so forth. But here's the thing. You know, we if people tend to develop this attitude when they stop focusing on God, when they stop focusing on the work of God, they stop looking to the Lord, they start looking kind of across at everybody else. And then if they're not careful, they can develop a very critical spirit and they can actually start to discourage other people. What we want to do is we want to look at other people in our lives and our, our, our brethren you know, in, in the church and we want to encourage them. We want to see the potential that they all have. And you have to remember that. Every single person has potential to do great things for God. It doesn't matter what their background is. It doesn't matter what their age is. It doesn't matter what gender they are. None of that. You know, everyone has the potential to do great things for God. So we want to be able to see that and then encourage that in other people. We need to recognize the fact that God's servants are God's servants. And therefore, we are not at liberty to just dismiss them. At our caprice. Actually, what we should be trying to do in our lives is to encourage them. <clears throat> and this will be easier, uh, be easier for someone to do when you start to realize that nobody is perfect, that no one is going to walk through those doors, no one's going to sit in these pews, no one's going to stand behind this pulpit and be a perfect person. You know, everybody has faults, everybody has shortcomings, and if we want to just start nitpicking and start, you know, biting and devouring one another, we'll be consumed. We just want to start <clears throat> pointing out everybody's shortcomings and focusing on that, you know, this isn't going to last. Nothing's going to get done, and people are going to get discouraged, and God's going to get angry with the people that would do that. 
We don't want to fall into that category. We don't want to make God upset. We need to realize nobody is perfect. You know, and not even the men that Jesus himself chose were perfect. You know, the disciples had flaws. Did you know that even the Apostle Paul had flaws? That they were all men of like passions? If you would, go over to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. You know, when Jesus went to go pick his 12 disciples, he didn't say, well, let me just find the most upstanding, perfect individual who has no faults. Because that would, you know, he was he, the only person he could pick is himself. Because he's God. <clears throat> He said in verse 8 of Luke 5, when, and of course this is him calling Peter after the miracle of fishes. It says in verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at, his, at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And Jesus said, You know what, Peter, you're right. Thanks for bringing me my senses. You're not going to cut it. I'm out of here. I'm going to go find somebody who's better than you. No, he said, he said, what, verse, uh, end of verse 10, and Jesus said unto him, fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. The truth is, is that the, the, the real servant, the person who is going to do great things for God, the person who has the most potential, is the person who doesn't need to have his faults pointed out because he already knows what they are. That's, Paul, that's uh, Peter. Peter's saying, I'm a sinful man. I'm not worthy to be a part of your ministry. And Jesus said, you're exactly who I'm looking for. You know, it, it's, it's actually the opposite. It's the guy that would say, you know, I, have, I meet all the qualifications. I'm the exact person you would want, Jesus. Uh, here, I volunteer myself. That's the guy that Jesus can say, no thanks, I can't use you. Because you're too full of yourself, you're too proud, you think you're all that. What he's really looking for is the person who recognizes the, the fact that they have faults. He's not looking for somebody who's faultless. He's looking for somebody who recognizes the fact that they have faults. And the point I'm trying to make here is that we all have faults. We can all be used of God, you know, and we would love to believe that about ourselves, and we should, but we should also believe that about other people too. Now, you know, we should also look at other people and recognize the fact that's a potential Peter over there. That could be a Paul. That could be a whoever. And we need to see the potential in other people and not discourage them. Jesus saw the potential in Peter, and he, what did he do? He looked past his shortcomings. Right, and, and we all know the story of Peter. He had some shortcomings, didn't he? We'll talk about one of them in, towards the end. But Jesus, you know, he was, he was pitiful. So how are you going to see the potential in others? You know, it's, it's one thing to just get up and say that, but how are you actually going to put this into practice? Number one, you should be pitiful. And what I mean by that is being merciful. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Coincidentally, the same guy that had, we just read said, depart from me. Here he is. Now we're reading a book that he wrote. He was used mightily of God, not because he was perfect, but because somebody took the time to see the potential that he had and nourished that and fostered that and didn't discourage him and practiced several of the things that we're going to look at this morning. One was pity. Jesus took pity upon Peter, didn't he? He, he reassured him. And then, you know, Peter learned this lesson firsthand, and he goes on to remind other people that they need to do the same thing. He said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Finally, be of all one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, be not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that you are thereunto called and that you should inherit a blessing. Now, I want to focus in on this idea of being pitiful by looking at the fact that Peter has says here says, love uh, as brethren. We are to love as brethren, right? Now, isn't it true, brethren, that would be like siblings, right? Is it true that siblings fight? Is, is, that, like, is that like that in everybody else's house? Did you fight with your siblings? Wow, what a shocker, right? But this is the type of love that we have to have. Love as brethren, you know, as people that are going that are heirs together, uh, you know, with Christ. You know, we're gonna we're going to inherit glory together. We're gonna spend eternity with one another, but that doesn't mean we're always gonna get along, right? Siblings, they share the same house. They might even share the same room. They might even share the same bed. They've got to eat together. They've got to grow up together. But that doesn't mean that it's you know uh, just one big love fest the whole time. Sometimes they start to it's cats and dogs going at each other, right? And and you kind of see that in 1 Peter. He says there, love as brethren, be pitiful, right? Be courteous, 
not rendering evil for evil. He's talking about amongst us. Meaning this is that there's probably going to be, if you stick around long enough and you live the Christian life and you're faithful to church and you get to know the brethren, someone's going to render evil at some point. Someone's going to say something. Someone's going to do something. Someone's going to offend you. They're going to render evil. And at that point, that's where we have to do what? Be pitiful. Be courteous. Look past that fault and say, I'm not going to render evil for evil. I'm not going to render railing for railing. But contrary-wise, you know, the opposite, I'm going to bless. You know, saved people, you know, fellow church members are going to offend you. Because, again, nobody's perfect. But we all have potential. <clears throat> and here's the thing, you know, this is important to keep in mind because of the fact that we have enough of a battle on our hands without a bunch of infighting. And look, there's going to be some degree of that. I, I understand that. You know, that's just, the, that's just human nature. It's just the way it works. But we've got a big enough battle on our hands. When we have enough enemies, we don't need them in here. We don't need to start picking each other apart. We don't need to start, you know, uh, tearing each other down. We got, you know, my wife just got a text from some fag over in San Francisco trying to, you know, plead the case for pedophiles. Some random person just texted my wife this morning. Well, you know, pedophiles, you know, not it's a very small percentage to actually act on their, their impulses. And it's not as bad. It's like, what are you talking about? Why are you texting my wife, you coward? You look up the area code. It's coming from San Francisco. So how do you know as a fact? I don't know. I just connected the dots, okay? I just put it together, okay? It's a roll of the dice. But, you know, chances are it's probably if you're, if you're texting my wife about, you know, pleading the case for pedophiles, I'm just going to go ahead and step on a limb and say you're probably a fag, all right? The point is this, okay, I'm not going to go off on that as much as I'd like to, is that we've got enough of a battle out there to where just random freaks are going to be text messaging, you know, our spouses. They might be parading around out there. We've got enough of a battle. We've got the world, the flesh, and the devil to fight. We don't need it in here. We don't need to bring that in the church house. We need to love as brethren. You know, Paul warned the Corinthians about going to, war, going to law uh, with one another, you know, suing one another. And he said of them that there is a fault among them because they go to law one to another. I mean, can you imagine your brother in Christ suing you, taking you to court? You say that never happens. It happened in Corinthians. I, I know of churches. They have some split in there, and now they're going to sue. You know, one group of people gets to the other one. They're going to sue. They're going to, you know, they're going to uh, sue one another to get possession of the building. They're going to, you know, take people to court for defamation of character. They do all kinds of crazy things. Because they're carnal, like the Corinthians were. And what they're doing is they're rendering evil for evil. They're rendering railing for railing. They should just what, do what Paul said in 1 Corinthians and just suffer themselves to be defrauded. Be pitiful, right? Be pitiful. You know, when somebody offends me, when somebody does something wrong, when somebody, you know, does me, if it's my brother and they, they do evil in some way or shape or form, you know, the best thing to do is just be pitiful and just forgive them without even expressing any kind of, you know, anger. No, I get it. Sometimes, you know, if the offense is serious enough, we need to go, hey, you know, he offended me. And people will probably apologize. But that's what it means to see the potential in other people, is look past their faults. Look past all the things that they're going to do that might offend you, and just be pitiful, be merciful, right? I mean, we've got enough of a battle on our hands. We don't need to bring it in here. And you say, well, that kind of thing's never going to go on. Well, Jesus dealt with it. Go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 20. Jesus dealt with infighting in his ministry. And probably because of all those sinners he chose to be part of his ministry, right? Probably because of the fact that nobody in his ministry was perfect. And he had to deal with, you know, he had to work out the squabbles and the drama. And he had to, you know... You know, take the brethren, just like parents do with the kids. Sometimes you just got to separate them. You just got to go, hey, you know, if you can't play nice together, don't play together. And Jesus dealt with infighting in his ministry. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, James and John, right, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of, of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism where I am baptized with? And they said, We are able. He saith unto them, 
ye shall indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to him, uh, to them for whom it is prepared of my father. Now, don't you think that's kind of a pretty big request to say, hey, when you come into your kingdom, I want my son on your right hand and my other son on your left. That's literally what she's asking. You know, when you're up on the throne and you're receiving all the glory and the praise and the worship and the honor, you know, I just want my kids to be right there next to you. And that's a good ask. If you, you know, we could, the disciples here, of course, they start, we're going to see it, we're going to read it. They kind of, they get mad, right? They get upset. But, you know, that is, should be our desire. We should want to be that close to Christ. We should want to be that close to his glory. I think that was a good thing. And, and Paul, or excuse me, Jesus didn't rebuke her for it. He just said, hey, it's not mine to give. Meaning this, somebody's going to get it. I just don't know who it is. It's not mine to give. It's prepared of my father. Look at verse 24. And when the 10 heard it, they said, wow, I wish I would have asked for that. Or those guys are so spiritual, right? Good for them. I'm glad that they have a heart for that. No. They were moved with indignation against the two brethren. It's the 12 disciples. They heard that and they're like, who do they think they are? They're mad. They get upset. That's indignation. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. So Jesus, he's dealing with this infighting in his own ministry, and he rebukes this attitude. He rebukes this attitude of, this, you know, of them getting upset, and having indignation, and fighting with, it, with their own brethren. You know, and you say, well, why, why would they even go there? Why would they be so upset with them? Why, why couldn't they just see that what they were asking was a good thing? It's probably because they, they lost, you know, um, they stopped paying attention to the work. I love verse 27. It says, and whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many, and as they departed from Jericho, Jericho, a great multitude followed them, or followed him. I mean, that's what they should have been focused on, is the work. If they had looked at the fact that Jesus is, you know, we're in the midst of his ministry, who cares who sits on his right hand or his left? I, you know, and, the, and really, Jesus says, look, he that will be greatest among you be a servant. You should want that for other people. You should want other people to succeed. You should other want other people to be exalted. You should want other people to... Uh, you know, reach their potential. But how do you do that? By being pitiful, by not rendering railing for railing, not being upset when somebody else, you know, maybe is going to, you know, get something from God that maybe you didn't get. <clears throat> if you would, go over to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. You know, so that's the ideal, isn't it? <clears throat> is that Brethren, you know, they would be pitiful, they would be courteous, they wouldn't render evil for evil, they, they wouldn't render railing for railing. That's the ideal. That's what Jesus said. You want to be the greatest, be the servant. Go ahead, John. Go ahead, James, take that seat. I want you to have it. I'm glad for you. That should have been their attitude, and that is the ideal. But is that how it always works out? Nope. Sadly, <laughs> sadly not. A lot of times, like I said earlier, the, the only thing you can do is just separate the siblings. Sometimes you just have to take brethren and just go, all right, you, you, you can't play together. Look at Acts chapter 15, verse 35. Paul also and Barnabas continue in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. So Paul and Barnabas, I mean, they've been working together They've been laboring together. They're starting churches. They're winning souls. I mean, these guys are close. And you know, anytime you, you, you labor that closely with somebody, you're, you're going to have a closer friendship with that person. You're going to have shared experiences. You're going to have gone through trials and tribulations. These guys are close. It was, they weren't just passing acquaintances. They were ministers together in the gospel. And he's saying, let's go to these churches that we preach to and see how they do. Verse 37, and Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia when they, when he, uh, and went not with them to the work. So they're ready to go on this trip. And Barnabas says, well, let's take John, let's take John Mark with us. Paul says, no, the last time he was with us, he went not to the work. He departed. It's not good to take him. Now, 
We can debate on whether or not who was right and who was wrong. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that it's verse 39. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. I mean, you had these two guys that had just been laboring together, spending all this time together, and then, then just this one little thing pops up. And you would think that they could just see past that. You know, that they would just say, well, you know, I guess I don't need to take John with me. You're, yeah, you're right, Paul. Uh, you know what, Barnabas? Yeah, bring him along. If he departs again, what's the big deal? But it becomes this, this point of contention. Maybe they just spent too much time together. I don't know. Maybe they, they finally reached that point where they're just kind of like, well, we need to just take a break from one another for a while. But it says the contention was so sharp between them that they departed one from another. And we can learn from this is that sometimes, you know, brethren are not always going to be friends. Not, they're not always going to be friends. You know that's possible to be somebody's brother and not be their friends? I mean, you know, maybe that, <laughs> that might be the case with some of us. Maybe we have some sibling that we're just not very close to, right? It could happen in here, too. You know, we could all be saved. We can be on our way to heaven. We could be uh, working towards the same goal. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're all going to be best friends. And no one can make them be friends. Sometimes brethren aren't going to be friends, and no one's going to make them be friends. And I'm not interested in doing that. Let me just go ahead and, and just go ahead and, and say that right now. Don't ever come to me and say, make so-and-so be my friend. Because people have done that, and not to me, but I've heard it happen elsewhere. Hey, you need to go tell so-and-so they have to be my friend. They don't have to be your friend. They don't. Now, they need to be friendly. They need to be kind. They need to be civil and polite and courteous, and all that, that doesn't mean that they have to, you know, have you over for every little get-together, and write you a birthday card, and, and make sure that, you know, and do all the little things that friends do for one another. You know, brethren can, are always going to be brethren, but that doesn't mean they're always going to be friends. But here's one thing brethren are always going to be, and that's God's servants. Whether they're your friend, or they're not your friend, there will be God's servant. They are still God's child, and they don't be, and you can't treat them uh, poorly because of that. They deserve a certain level of respect just because of that fact alone. I mean, look at uh, look what what happened in our story, verse thirty nine. The contention was so sharp between them; they departed asunder one from another. And we all know Paul was the real man of God, and Barnabas just turned into this evil, God hating reprobate that nobody could stand. Is that what happened? No, Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. They both went to the same work. Barnabas didn't quit the ministry. Barnabas just went and did his thing. He said, okay, well, Paul, we just, you know, we're brethren, but I guess we're not going to get along. We can't agree on this point. We're just going to have to go our separate ways. And he sailed in Cyprus. You know, Barnabas didn't stop serving God just because he wasn't hanging out with Paul anymore. He was still serving God without him. <clears throat> I mean, he made Mark profitable. If you, if you fast forward, you know, to 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'll read to you, where Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, only Luke is with me, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to, uh, to me for the ministry. So, you know, Paul at the beginning says, I don't want Mark around. He's, he, he left at the work at Pamphilius. They, Barnabas takes him and says, fine, I'll take him then, and we'll go do the work, and you go that way, we'll go this way, and we'll just both go do our thing. You know, years later, you have Paul here saying, telling Timothy, take Mark and bring him to me. He's profitable to me for the ministry. How did that happen? How do you think that happened? Mark just figured it out on his own? No, Barnabas got him there. Barnabas was the one that took Mark aside and said, hey, you know why Paul, me and Paul aren't together? It's because of you. <laughs> remember, when you remember when you flaked out in Pamphylia? You need to quit doing that and began to work with them and deal with them and brought him along. And what it, why? Because... Barnabas saw the potential in Mark, didn't he? And he was pitiful. I mean, he didn't say, well, you're lying, Paul. No, he didn't depart. No, he did depart. But Paul failed to see the potential anymore, didn't he? You know, perhaps Paul, in this matter of Mark, you know, he might have been pitiful, but he lacked something else. Because here's the thing. If we're truly going to see the potential in other people, not only do we have to be pitiful, but we have to be patient. You have to be patient with people. It's one thing to let things go and let things slide and not get offended over every little thing, but you also have to be patient. Give people the opportunity to learn and to grow in Christ. 
you know, in this church, you know, we're, we're Bible believing. We have some standards. You know, there's things that we believe that are going to be new to people. And, you know, and people need to be given the opportunity to learn those things and adopt those things and grow into those things on their own time, right? You know, people don't just start coming to church here and we just hand them some manual and say, this is what you must do. <laughs> you have to meet all of these standards and you have to do all X, Y, and Z if you want to go to church here. It's not how it works. You know, you got to be saved and that's pretty much it. <laughs> right? What I got to be a member? Show up. What do I got to become a member at Faithful Word? Start coming to Faithful Word and you're a member. Be saved. And the point I'm making is this. We need to be patient with other people. Let them grow in Christ. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Maybe that's what Paul was lacking there in that story in Acts. The fact that maybe he got a little impatient with John Mark. Maybe he's saying, why doesn't this kid get it? What do you mean you're going to quit on the work? I don't want, you know, he doesn't have the patience to deal with somebody like that, to bring him along. Now, maybe that's, you know, some, believe me, I'm not going to take Paul aside and grill him about it in heaven. <laughs> but it's, it very well could be the case. Paul could have had the fault like that, right? We need to give people the opportunity to learn and grow. We need to be patient with them because why? Because everyone starts out as a babe in Christ. They are babes in Christ. And like babes of the flesh, you know, people do things, they can't help themselves. They can't help it. They're just acting out their nature. They haven't grown. They haven't matured. You know, my, my, my little uh, darling Julie, when she throws a fit, I don't, I don't get full of indignation and wonder why she's doing that and try to explain to her, you know, why she can wait another five minutes for her mom to come back from doing whatever, you know, or, or you just ate. You don't need it. You know what I mean? It's, it'd be pointless to me to begin to lecture an infant to try to talk them off the ledge of some fit that they're throwing, right? Explain to them, well, get to your diaper. Can you just show some patience, please? You know, I know it's been a long day and you don't want to be in that car seat right now, Julie, but you need to understand that, you know, we have to X amount, it, it, it's be stupid. It, she's not going to go, oh, you're right, Dad. Sorry about that. Let me just knock it off. Why? Because she's a babe. She can't help herself. You know, and spiritually, people come into the house of God, people start to live for Christ. And you know what? There's certain things they just can't help themselves because they're babes and they have to grow. They have to mature and develop. And we that are, you know, have, have matured and have developed and have you know, taken on these things need to do what? Be patient and see the potential that's there. Not see what's lacking and go, oh, why, why this? Why that? When are you going to do this? When are you going to do that? It's be patient and let those things come, okay? Give people the opportunity. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul uses a real interesting analogy here. Verse 1, For yourselves, brethren, know the en our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, or in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth their hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, but when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Look at verse 7. But he's talking about how they were, how he behaved himself with the Thessalonian people, right? When, he, when they came into them, when he came and had their entrance unto them. Verse 7. But we were gentle among you. And how gentle were, was he? With these, with these Thessalonians, with these babes, even as a nurse cherish her, cherisheth her children. Now, I don't know that that's the analogy I would have chosen. <laughs> that's the one Paul used. That's the one God put in his word. Is that he's like, I'm like a nurse who, who is nursing a child. That's how gentle he was talking about being with these people. That's the amount of patience he's talking about having with people. That's what we need to do with people, with babes in Christ. You know, patience is something that's required of a nursing mother, isn't it? There's a lot of patience there with an infant. And a lot of patience has to be displayed if you're going to be caring for somebody like that. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. <clears throat> you know, we don't want to just take people's heads off, you know, ever. 
And people get so fired up sometimes and they get so self-righteous and so full of themselves that they, you know, they, 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 they go find some fault in somebody else and they just want to take their head off. And I think to myself, where's the gentleness in that? You'd make a terrible nursemaid. <laughs> don't, don't, I hope you don't ever have that responsibility. They're like that person just starts shaking the baby because there's no patience there. And here's, what's, and here's the thing, that's required. You have to have that patience. Or people are going to get hurt. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, uh, warn them that are unruly. Look, there's a time to, you know, talk tough. Warn them that are unruly. Hey, you need to work on this. You need to straighten this out. <clears throat> Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. But what's that there at the end? But be patient toward all men. Be patient toward all men. You know, patience is something that is required. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. How are you going to see the opportunity or the uh, potential in others? What are you going to do about it? Say, well, yeah, I understand everyone's God's child, everyone's God's servant. Great. So how, you, what, what does that mean to you this morning? It means you should be patient with people. It means you shouldn't just cut people off at the knees just because they don't, they, you know, they haven't got all their ducks in a row or whatever. You need to be patient with people. It's required, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Now we say, oh, the servant of the Lord, that's talking about the preacher. Well, last I checked, everyone's a servant of God. And we were all called to serve the Lord. Now obviously, the, all the more so for the, the pastor and the deacon who have to meet these requirements. But remember, they're given those requirements because they are in samples to the flock. They're supposed to be showing the flock how to live. And he's saying here, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Say, well, I don't know if I want to do that. Well, just consider the fact that God does the same for us, doesn't he? That's how God is towards us. How would you like it if God just clouded up and rained on you every time you did something wrong? Or every time you refused to, to change something in your life? If God just said, well, I'm not going to be patient with you then. And that's a real good reason for us to be patient with other people because God is going to, you know, render every man according to his works. And God sees us down here just lopping off heads and taking people out of the knees and being impatient and just cutting people down. Don't be surprised if he does the same with you. Under the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. And under the forward, thou wilt show thyself forward. God does the same for us. Anyone that's matured in the faith, anyone that's ever, you know, has has uh, you know, grown in Christ, has only done so because God has been patient with them. Because God saw their potential, and rather than just cutting them down over every little thing, gave them grace, gave them mercy, and showed patience, and allowed them to grow. David said in the Psalms, Thy gentleness hath made me great. Thy gentleness hath made me great. What was it that made David so great? God's gentleness, the fact that he led him along, that he was patient with him, that he gave him time to grow. If we see the potential in others, we will show pity. If we see the potential in others, we will be patient. But here's the thing. I want to kind of close on this thought here is that being patient is one thing. It, it, don't mistake. Let me say it this way. Don't mistake being patient with being passive. Okay? Sometimes we get this idea, well, I'm being patient with that person, so I'm just not going to help them at all. <laughs> I'm not, that means I shouldn't come to them and say, hey, did you know the Bible says this? Hey, did, are you aware of this? You know, and, and take them under your wing and kindly and gently. And that's what it said in 2 Timothy. And if you would, keep something in 2 Timothy if you've turned away from there. We're going to go back in a minute. But he said he'd be gentle all men, apt to teach. Not just I'm patient with all men and I just kind of wait for them to get it. He said, no, I'm, I'm gentle unto all men, but I'm also apt to teach. And I'm patient with them, waiting for them to get it, waiting for it to click. <clears throat> don't mistake being patient with being passive. Some people need to be pursued. Which means what? We need to be persistent. You want to see the potential in other people? You know, be pitiful, be patient, but be persistent with people. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, it says, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle all men, apt to teach patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You know, it's not that we don't instruct, it's just that we do it with meekness. 
We do it because we're not trying to, you know, uh, tear people down. We're trying to build them up. We're trying to bring them along. Okay. Because here's the thing: you can't you can't ignore a baby. You can't ignore a baby. You can't just well. I'll come back when I'll come back, Julie. When you know you're more reasonable. <laughs> we'll talk when you can finally learn how to talk. You know, when you're when you're more rational, then we'll you know until then I'm just going to completely ignore you. You know that a child's going to die. A child's going to perish. It, you know, same way spiritually. We can't just, you know, say, well, I'm being patient with that with people and just completely ignore them. We need to be persistent with people. And look, I understand everyone has boundaries and you know, we don't want to, you know, hound people. But, you know, and here's the thing, some babies can't handle being left alone longer than others, can't they? And there are some people that are going to do fine on their own. They're going to get on their own. But some people, they need to be pursued. They need to have some pressure put on them a little bit. They need to be encouraged. They need to be motivated, which means that us, we who are trying to see the potential in others, need to be persistent with other people. I mean, Paul did it. We read it there in Acts 5. That was what Paul and Barnabas were setting out to do, to go see and how the brethren in every city where they preach the word, see how they do. They were going to follow up on their converts and, and bring them along. We have to be persistent, which means this, that you have to be prepared. You have to be prepared. If you're going to see the potential in other people, you have to be patient, you have to be pitiful, you have to be persistent, you have to be willing to go and instruct other people in meekness. But you also have to be prepared. I mean, what are you going to teach them if you don't know anything? I mean, what, what, what can you give somebody that you yourself don't have? You have to be prepared. And really, that's one thing that, you know, people who seem to just go around wanting to just tear everybody apart seem to lack the most is their own self-development. They seem to lack in a lot of areas. Be prepared to help, to instruct, to encourage. In meekness, and in, in instructing those that oppose themselves. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, iron sharpeneth iron, which means that you need to be iron. You yourself need to be sharp. You yourself need to what? Be prepared. Because here's the thing, and, and this is the, the kind of the closing thought here, is that instruction is the duty of us all. You want to see the, the potential in other people? Understand that the instruction is the duty of us all. It's not just the preacher's job. It's not just my job to be the bad guy, to get up and just, you know, we don't want to just sit by and say, well, I, I know so-and-so will get all, that'll figure it out once the preacher preaches on it. Why don't you go talk to that person? Why don't you go in meekness and talk to that person and show them from the Bible? When, when they come to you, why don't you, oh, I'm sure he'll preach on that a bit. Oh, here's a sermon. Well, why don't you open the Bible and explain it? Why don't you be prepared to do that? It's the duty of us all, rather than just, you know, say, well, let, let Brother Corbin <laughs> do all that heavy lifting. And look, I'm going to preach what needs to be preached and do what I need to do to instruct and so on and so forth. But that doesn't mean we just all, the rest of us just sit on our laurels and just, you know, wait. You know, we should be helping and instructing others and encouraging them. <clears throat> And I'm going to move along for sake of time here, but I think that's an important point that we should take to heart. Because here's the thing, some things are going to be better received by people when they come from the pew and not from the pulpit. You know, some things that I, I might need to preach that people are just going to bristle at and they're not going to like it because it's coming from me. It's coming from here. But what if it came from a friend? What if it came from somebody that they learned to respect? What if it came from somebody in the church who gently went to them one-on-one -on -one and showed them those things. It'd probably be better received. Not all the time, but I believe that is the case in some instances. You need to be prepared to help and to instruct and to encourage. And I'm trying to just motivate us this morning to see the potential in other people. See the potential in other people. And you need to be prepared. And you, not, you need to be prepared not only to, to, to help and instruct, but you need to be prepared to be disappointed okay and this i don't like to end sermons on a down note but it's just a fact of life it's just a reality you are you know if you take this on and say i'm going to see the potential in others i'm going to do my part you need to be prepared to be disappointed because we will invest in people we will instruct people we will pour our hearts into people we'll pray for people try to bring people along we'll see the potential that they have and then they'll make wrong decisions and they'll do things the complete opposite of everything that they've been told. 
And it's nothing new under the sun. I mean, I've been, in, I've been in a lot of different churches now. Well, not a lot of different churches, but I've been in church long enough to see that the church front door is a revolving one, that people are just constantly coming and going, constantly coming and going. <clears throat> and you know what? You could, I could just throw up my hands and say, well, what's the point? You know, it's just so discouraging. Well, I'm just trying to prepare you right now. You're prepared to be disappointed. So that way when it does happen, you know, it's not such a, a shock. It's not such a blow. You say, oh, I've been investing in this person. I've been putting so much into them. I've been, I see so much potential. I've been trying to help them along. And then, poof, they're gone. They make some decision, whatever. <clears throat> People are going to disappoint you. Go to 2 Timothy. We're closing here, 2 Timothy. He says in chapter 1, verse uh, 15, Thou knowest, this thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are phygelus and Hermogenes. In order for them to have turned away from Paul, it means that they had to have at one point been turned to Paul. All they that were in Asia were probably the people that Paul got you know, converted or preached to or taught the word of God to. That's who he's talking about. You know, Phygelus and Hermogenes were probably people that Paul at one point had taken under his wing. Then he's saying, this thou knowest, that they be what? Turned away. They turned on him. Do you think Paul might have gotten a little disappointed over that? Do you think that might have been a little bit of discouragement to Paul? 100%. But what did Paul do? Say, that's it. I quit. What's the point? No. He stuck in there. He, he, he stuck by himself. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. He said in verse 16, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. You've know, you got to be prepared if you're going to see the potential of other people and pour yourself into them and instruct them that sometimes they're going to do the wrong thing. They're going to make the wrong decision. They're going to disappoint you. It's going to happen. That's no reason for you to get bitter and angry and upset with that person or anybody else. You still need to learn to what? See the potential in other people. Be pitiful. Be patient. We have to learn to see the potential in others. We need to practice pity. We need to practice patience. We need to practice persistence with people as they grow in the things of the Lord. And you have to be prepared for disappointment. You know, part of being prepared is not just writing people off for not growing for not, you know, coming along as quickly as you think they should. You know, for them not growing at what our preferred rate. You don't just write people off over that. That's a guarantee that, that people will not grow. Look, if, if, if we don't practice these things, if we do, uh, you know, just try to, how can I say this? <clears throat> you don't want to just write people off, okay? You don't want to just write people off and just say, well, you know, they're not growing. They're, they, they, they made this decision, they did that, they did this, whatever, okay? They're not, they're not I, I think they should be at this point by now. That, after all, that's where I was, you know. You know, I came into this church, I was already King James only. I already had all these standards. I already knew the post-trib rapture. I already had all these doctrines, John. What's wrong with these people? And that's a surefire way to get people to not grow. That's a, that's a, that's a surefire way to discourage people from growing. That's a guarantee that they will cease to grow. What we want to do is the opposite. Be patient with people, be pitiful, and be prepared to instruct them and not get discouraged when it doesn't always stick. Because here's the thing, it's going to stick with some people. Some people are going to come along, and some people are going to get it, and some people are going to grow, and some people are going to do great things for God. Some are, but here's the thing, everyone has the potential to do it. We just need to learn to see it. Let's go ahead and pray.